I was glad to be back home with family and friends. I lived at home with my parents and worked on the construction with my dad. I was able to spend time with my horses every day and ride whenever I wanted to. Early in February 1988, Chad came with me to Saskatoon to pick up a black Great Dane puppy. Naming a pet is important and I felt that the name needed to reflect the personality of that animal. I saw the name Destry in a horse magazine once and when I told Chad he thought that was perfect. It would be short for Destroyer. This puppy was going to go through a lot of shoes and dog toys before he grew out of that teething stage. The Black Great Dane puppy became Destry, although he acquired other names in his lifetime. The likes of Gobbleguts, Marmaduke, Duke, and a few unmentionables. Mom and Dad weren't too crazy about having a huge puppy in our house along with the chihuahuas we already had, but welcomed Destry into the family anyway. Destry ate everything. It was only a matter of months before he had doubled in size. His head was too heavy for his neck while he was growing, and we would often see him standing by a chair resting his head on the armrest. We taught him many tricks, and he loved to be out at the barn with me and the horses. Destry loved to run with the horses, and playing with Mighty was one of his favorite things to do. Destry never chased a horse in his life, but he would jump straight up in front of Mighty because he was the youngest playful horse, and jumped until Mighty would lay his ears back and chase him. It was not unusual for us to see Destry running across the pasture with pursuit. By the time Destry was full grown, he was the size of a pony and measured 31 inches at the shoulder. He was a horse himself, and the horses loved that dog too because Raisin would lick him. In mid-June, I started Mighty to saddle. He was a difficult horse to work with. He seemed to accept the saddle all right until I went to put my foot in the stirrup. Then he started to spin. I lost my balance and jumped off. Wouldn't you know it? I landed on a rock. Jumping on that rock broke bones in my foot, and that required casting, so I rode with a cast on and had pictures of me riding raisin using only one stirrup showing off practicing a set of barrels. The cast lasted the sum total of three weeks. I made Chad use tin snips to cut it off because I knew the doctor wouldn't remove the cast until six weeks were over. My orange cowboy boots had recently been resold, so I wore them for support until my foot healed. I continued to work for my dad on and off as I had no other real job prospects at the time. Later that fall, I worked with Mighty and thought I was making great progress. One cool day, I rode him in the two-acre pasture south of the barn and corrals. Mighty spooked, bucked, and ran as fast as he could toward the end of the field. I lost my balance and went over his right shoulder, but forgot to let go of the reins. I estimated I was dragged for about 20 feet on the back of my head before I either let go or he slipped the reins out of my hand. I obviously lived and did not break my neck. How? I don't know. I think that all through my life I have kept my guardian angels really busy. My neck swelled up and I couldn't nod my head or turn it either way for about two weeks after that. Lesson learned. In January 1989, while driving in the city with my mom, we were rear-ended by another vehicle on icy roads, and my neck was injured again. It would be a long road to recovery. There were months of unbearable neck pain and physiotherapy. I had my horses for companionship, but was una unable to ride very much until later in the summer. That summer, Chad and a few friends rode in the parade with me. Chad would ride with me when and if it suited him, which was fine by me. He seemed to have a natural knack for riding and was always conscious if he was doing it right or not. Chad would watch me ride and then pepper me with questions about how to hold the reins and so on. We never had a bad ride together or any other crazy mishap while riding. We just had a whole lot of good, clean fun. He was my brother and I was always proud of him for it seemed that no matter what he chose to do, he was always good at it. Chad was one of the few people that could or would attempt to ride Fury, because Fury was always spirited. 
the only thing that upset me about Chad riding Fury was the way he would mount him bareback. Chad was so tall and athletic and Fury was short, so he would just set his foot over Fury's back and slide on. Very much like I might get on a small pony. Then Chad would get this big smirk on his face and rub it in how tall he was. Brothers. Autumn brought a new job and a move to Wasika, Saskatchewan. I would be working on another thoroughbred horse farm, one of a smaller scale than Park Stud in Ontario. Wasika is a small town and is on the highway about 30 miles or 50 kilometers east of Lloydminster, which is right on the Saskatchewan-Alberta border. My family assisted with the move. A house on the yard site was included with the job. Destry came with me for company. The house was a nice older two-bedroom bungalow with nine-foot ceilings. It was a neat little house with a great porch that had a sink for washing up, and the kitchen was huge. There was also a small one-car garage for me to store my vehicle inside in the winter. I was excited to be living on my own in my own space. My family stayed with me for the night, helped me settle in and go to Lloydminster to stock my kitchen and fridge with groceries I would need. Then they went home. My boss and his wife were an older couple in their 70s. Tom had bred, raised, and raced thoroughbreds in Calgary and Edmonton for years. He had approximately 16 horses at the time and some of those horses were on the track in training. It was my responsibility to feed the horses, muck the stalls in two barns, one barn of four stalls, the big barn had eight stalls, and the remainder of the day I would be working with Tom, working with the horses in general, or general farming duties. I drove the farm truck. It was a green Chevrolet half ton with a hoist on the box. The truck had never left the farm and it had low miles but you would not have known this from the look of the body. The truck had horse teeth marks all over the hood, dents in the doors, fenders, and box from horses kicking or striking it. It was a real piece of work. The tailgate for the truck was stored in the machine shop, and it looked brand new. The truck had no plates on it. This truck was used for hauling the manure out of the barn and out onto the fields where it would be worked into the ground in spring. The aisles of the barn were wide enough to accommodate the truck, so made barn cleaning a breeze. The horses were fed at 7 a.m. and I had an hour to eat my own breakfast in my house before turning the horses out and cleaning the barn. I was usually done cleaning the barn by 10 or 10.30 and then it was coffee time. I would often have coffee with Tom and his wife. The farm truck was also used to exercise the horses that would be going to the track early in the spring. We exercised the young horses in the morning before lunch. Tom made a track out in one of his many fields, and that is where we would run the horses. Tom drove the truck, and I held one or two horses from the box of the truck, and then we would gallop them for about 20 minutes or so. Not fast, but they'd take them out for a good run around the track a few times. This was his exercise program for his young horses to get them into shape for the track five or six days a week, depending on which weekend I had off. I went home to Swift Current on most of my weekends off. It was a long and unusually cold winter, and on the days when it was minus 40 Celsius, nothing more than feeding and barn cleaning was expected. The horses were only turned out for the length of time that it took me to clean the barn, and then they wanted back in too. That winter, Tom brought three horses home off the track their racing careers were over. It was my responsibility to retrain them as riding horses. Tom's thoroughbreds were not as tall as the thoroughbreds I had seen in Ontario. The ones I retrained for Tom were between 15 and 15 and a half hands high. One of the ex-racers that I retrained was a sorrel gelding named North. He was the first cribber I ever encountered, and I would never want to own one. Cribbing is when a horse braces his top teeth on something and hangs off it and sucks air in through their mouth. It's a horrible habit that strains the horse's neck muscles and can cause stomach problems. Other than that, he was a nice horse to ride, had fairly nice gaits, and was willing to go at a walk, trot, or lope 
He wasn't very fast, and that was probably why he was brought home. There was an electric wire on top of the fence surrounding all of the paddocks and pens. North was put in an outside paddock with another horse, and even though they could graze and run, he would still find a way to crib. He would resort to using the ground beneath his feet if he had to. North was so fixated on cribbing, unless he was being ridden, that he remained racehorse thin. Another bay mare that I retrained was Debbie. She was a great mare and would have made an excellent barrel or pole bending prospect. She was fast with controlled gaits and I loved to ride her. With her athleticism and a level head, I seriously considered buying her from Tom, but he gave Debbie to his daughter and she left the farm. What I learned about retraining thoroughbreds is that when they come off the track, they only know two things, run and turn left. You have to teach them the rest. Usually they have the worst habits from being stalled all the time, and it is a rare one that leaves the racetrack without picking up a vice. I used to remember all the horses at the farm, but what sticks in my memory were the names that Chad came up for them when he would come to visit me on the weekends and help me with chores. When we walked in the barn door on our immediate left was yes, and beside yes was no. The horse named yes would always nod his head up and down with his head over the door of the stall. No was a weaver, so he would weave back and forth. There was one nice bay gelding beside No, and he didn't have any vices. Beside him was Alcatraz. Chad came up with this name because the yearling stud colt in that stall had bars on top of his stall door so he could not stick his head out. There was one more stall on that side of the barn, but that horse was an insignificant broodmare. Back at the front of the barn on the right-hand side was the tack room, and in the stall beside it was Circular. This was a tall chestnut long yearling, very beautiful with a lot of racing promise, but he would walk circles in his stall nonstop. Then was an alley to an outside door where the hay was under a roof outside of the door. The next stall was a foaling stall and there was a bread mare in there, circulars dam, one eye. She had lost her eye many years before in an in an unfortunate accident, but was an excellent broodmare. Beside one eye was Debbie. Those were the horses that Chad renamed, and those are the names I remember. It's comical how a person's memory works. In the spring of 1990, I took my coaching theory test and got my certificate for that. It was important to me to work on becoming a certified riding coach. I was also allowed to bring Raisin and Mighty to the farm. A separate paddock was provided for them. Their paddock was right across from my house so that I could see them. It was nice to be able to ride my own horses in the evenings when I wasn't working. In the spring, Destry went back to mom and dad's. Tom's wife was scared of him. The farm was two miles south of the highway and my boss owned the hill two fields further south and east that was the second highest point in all of Saskatchewan. I often would ride one of the thoroughbreds up there, and on a clear day, I could see Lloydminster from there. <clears throat> Summer work was hard. In addition to caring for the horses, I helped Tom with baling and stacking hay bales for the horses. I was used to hard work. One horrid task was to clean out an old wooden grain bin with moldy pellets in it. I was sick afterwards from breathing in all that moldy dust and had to take allergy medication all summer just to get by. I never had allergies before that in my life. In the fall, there was straw to bale and put up as well. <clears throat> by November, I was unhappy. I had worked so hard, and after a year of working there, I was hoping for a small raise, which I did not get or ask for. Farm laborers were underappreciated and underpaid. It was a fact. I quit my job, packed up, and moved back to my parents. I still had some neck and head issues from my previous injuries, so was plagued with headaches and neck pain. Early in 1991, I went for more physiotherapy. <clears throat> 
That winter and spring, my dad worked with another contractor building a facility west of Swift Current for the rabbit producers. My cousin worked there, and eventually I got a job there too. I was responsible for an entire barn full of rabbits that were being bred and raised for meat. I was happy that I worked with live rabbits, a job which I enjoyed. There was money to be made raising rabbits. Our barn at home was converted to house rabbits for a two-year period. At the time, there was an addition put on the front of the barn. My mom had her own rabbit barn and sold breeding stock from the rabbits she produced. In July that year, I wrote and received my Equestrian Western Coaching Award for the technical portion. A few weeks later, I completed the riding portion of the examination on a retrained raisin and became a certified level one Western coach. I had been riding to a pen pal in Australia for a few years and had a dream. My favorite movie was The Man from Snowy River, and my dream was to ride in the snowy mountains of Australia. I had money saved up from my settlement with the accident my mom and I had been in and had been putting money away to pay for my return plane ticket to Australia. In the fall, I booked my flight and submitted a written letter to the rabbit farm asking for a two-month sabbatical beginning in mid-February 1992. I was a hard worker and well-liked at my place of employment, so they willingly agreed to my request. Prior to my departure, one of my co-workers gave me contact information for his cousin who lived in Brisbane, Australia. This contact would become very important to me. Roni was now living in Calgary and had been for a few years. Mom and I visited with Roni for a day before they both saw me off on my flight out of the country. I flew out of Calgary on February 17, 1992. First stop was Salt Lake City, Utah. A one-hour stop there and a change of planes. Next stop, Los Angeles. I had a 12-hour layover in Los Angeles. A 14-hour flight to Sydney, Australia was awesome in that the plane seemed empty and I had four seats to myself, so I slept most of the flight overseas. The plane landed in Sydney, where I boarded a plane for the short flight to Brisbane and my arrival on February 20th, 1992. It was minus 17 Celsius when I left Calgary Airport and was a sweltering plus 30 Celsius when I got off the plane in Australia. I wasn't dressed for the weather, so it was a shock to my system. I caught the first taxi available and went to a motel that served breakfast and supper. A shower and change of clothes did wonders for me. I was tired, but far too excited to sleep. I contacted my pen pal and hired a taxi to take me to her house, which was an hour away. We had been corresponding for three years by then, but when I met her, she no longer owned a horse and was living with her dad and brother. I was somewhat dismayed with meeting her in person. We went for a walk and visited, and then I went back to my motel room for a much-needed rest. After breakfast in the morning, I packed my suitcase and went to stay with my pen pal for two days. I called my co-worker's cousin, and she offered to pick my pen pal me up the following afternoon for tea. We met Jerry, and she took us home with her. I didn't know until she was serving the evening meal that supper was tea in Australia. Oh, I can see I have a lot to learn. Jerry lived with Cyril, her partner of 20 years. Cyril was an interesting fellow. He did not like my pen pal but would banter easily with me. It was a nice evening and we had a lovely visit getting to know one another. I was instantly drawn to Jerry and liked her. She offered me a place to stay if I should require one. After the second night at my pen pals, I awoke to witness a cockroach crawling out of my suitcase. I was so disgusted that I called Jerry and asked her if she could come and pick me up. I only saw my pen pal a few times after that during the two months I was down under. Jerry was close to my mom, my mom's age. She had no children of her own, and even though I was a young woman in my early 20s, she took me under her wing and treated me as if I were her own daughter. It took several days before I could look up at a tree. It may have been jet lag, but I honestly felt as though I would fall over backward. 
When Jerry had days off at work, we would take day trips to see all of the local sites within a few hours of Brisbane. Without her, I would not have seen so many sites. We toured Mount Tambourine and O'Reilly's, where we went on a treetop walk, the Gold Coast and the Etamoga Pub. I wanted desperately to take a bus tour to Ayers Rock, but Jerry and Searle couldn't go with me and wouldn't let me travel alone. At the time, there were murders along one stretch of the highway I would have to travel to get there, and some of the murder victims had even been kidnapped off tour buses. The serial murderer was still at large, so I was not going to see Ayers Rock. Jerry drove me to all the tack shops in and around Brisbane, where I purchased an Australian stock saddle, not an expensive one, but one I could afford. I bought the whole kit for the saddle and a Barku bridle as well. The tack was shipped home to Mum until I could get back to try it out on my horses. We also went to the Drysabone factory there in Brisbane, where I purchased an oilskin coat for half price that was a second. There was some small flaw in it, which I still can't find to this day. We went to markets too, where I bought mementos and souvenirs for my friends and family back home. I could not bypass this one event, even though it had nothing to do with horses. It was Jerry's birthday, and we were meeting her workmates for supper at a restaurant in Brisbane. Jerry, Searle, and I were getting dressed up and ready to go out. Searle was ready first, of course, so was waiting on us ladies. Jerry wore a green print dress and sandals and went out to the kitchen. The dress I wore that evening was popular at the time, a form-fitting dress of bright, bold, flowered material accessorized with beige sandals with three-inch heels. As she went into the kitchen, Jerry asked Searle, how she looked. I was just about to walk into the room when Cyril said, you look like a fat green lizard. Cyril was like that and as I walked into the kitchen he said, oh look and here comes a six-foot fruit salad. All three of us burst out laughing. After that my loud print dress became known as my fruit salad dress. Jerry was making a trip home to Canada near the end of March and would be in Canada for two months. I booked a horseback riding adventure to begin on the 22nd. Jerry would put me on the bus to go south to Canberra for a week, and she would be gone when I returned. Arrangements were made for Cyril to pick me up after my week down south, and I would stay with him until I went home in April. I would see Jerry again back in Canada when I got home. The horseback riding adventure at Raynella was geared for any level of rider. It was worth every penny I paid to go. Rather than recount the entire riding adventure, I will leave you with the poem I wrote after the ride was over. Napoleon's Troop, Riding the Snowy Mountains Well, good day, mates. I'm here to tell the tale of our trek out on the Kosciuszko Trail. The date we met, March 22nd, 1992. There's a part of us all. This is meant for all of you. We started out at Providence and rode on through the day. Got to know each other better. There's a lot more to say. Owner of Raynella, John was our host. At first he must have thought we were deaf as a post. Silently wishing we'd get back on that bus. No worries, thought he. He'd make riders of us. It rained our first night out, we wore our dries of bones, spent our week out on the trail where there are no phones. There's much to tell of us all, we'll talk of each other throughout the fall. If I can't rem remember all of it, just don't you go and fret. Stuart the pyromaniac kept us all warm, and the tea he made though strong did us no harm. Avon, our palmy, was such a sweet lass, but the first day out landed right on her ass. Dallas, our cook, brought out his guitar, and when he started to sing, we knew he wa why he wasn't a star. Dallas cooked meals that were delicious, even though at times he could get malicious. Bill joined our trek, oh, what the heck, to make sure we wouldn't have a wreck. He also cleaned up, helping with dishes, talking and enjoying our company while silently making wishes. 
Peter was the brain of our fantastic group, he may well have joined Napoleon's troop. Mark Florain was his name. Napoleon Mon General became his fame. On this trip, anyway. Napoleon rode Josephine, his white stallion. Leader of the brigade, where was his medallion? We rode our mountain horses up the dusty trail. No one's spirit seemed to lag or fail. Through gum trees and creeks, where we all went, by the end of a long day's ride, we all were fairly spent. We rode a hard trail from Providence to Tentangra Dam, where we slept like babes in a pram. Greg and Mark were telling jokes and drinking beer, so were a few others. Always bumming smokes, they had no fear. Mitzi the Canadian got the brunt of the rabbit jokes. Throughout their harassment, she figured they weren't bad blokes. Linda had on her every jumper, feeling a bit under the weather. We all were concerned. No wonder she's light as a feather. The following morning, we were up to dine just as the sun started to shine. Packed our gear for another day. Most seemed happy and gay. Mounted up, Tentangra gone. Despite some stiffness, we pressed on. Crossed more creeks, had a canter. Stopped for lunch and swam despite the banter. On rode we with no mishaps, except for the odd dropped hat. Jill's red hat always flying off, stopping and waiting, some started to cough. Into camp we rode, referred to his old campsite. Mitzi and Jenny fought with their tent, no one helped, just for spite. Donna returned too late, told of her trip to the loo, thought she'd been discovered. It was only a roo. Jenny told her of her tales of the Navy, of seasick voyages, she must have been crazy. The evening as most was spent in laughter. We spoke of hot showers the day after. The following day, once we all arose, had morning tea and kept our pose. Our second last day out, curious of our route, closer to showers, we could have given a shout. Our day was spent mostly crossing the plains. We saw brumbies, couldn't get close, which caused us some pain. Donna rode a red roan mare, and did that girl ever have a head of hair? Kate and Carla kept up at front, Napoleon singing. They took the runt. Carla was from Adelaide, and oh, the price we paid. She rode a bit of dressage, and with all of the photos, we'll have quite a collage. Helen and Lisa, our Swedish pair, rode quite well for all the wear and tear. Dusan was ever helpful wherever we went. It seemed his energy was all but lent. Julie rode a horse named Skinny, rode him quite well, and even though her humor made us feel swell. Thursday lunch at the Blue Water Hole was served. While the Sheilas changed into their causies, some of the blokes perved. The troop rode on again, up and around Cave Creek's bend, took a peek in Monday's cave. In the darkness, we were brave. Back to old campsite we rode, on steak for tea, our plates we did load. John encouraged Napoleon to call up the herd. In French, he called, par ici, an unusual word. Then John called, par ici, par ici, French for come here. Napoleon called in English while we all laughed on. We played a strange game, around and around and back again. Grant gave us all a good laugh, trying to keep up with Peter the Brain. Helen and Lisa joined in the fun. We were saying all things under the sun. Everyone's mistakes created havoc. We all laughed and mocked. Harold was a real delight, but oh, what a sight. His moleskins were black. Try to imagine that. With all of his silly jokes, how was that? Kate always jo joined in the humor, and if they say she didn't, it's only a rumor. We tried, as always, to make the night last, but it crept beyond us and ended too fast. Friday morning come low and behold, many slept in, as we were told. Our last day together as one group, we would be referred to as Napoleon's troop. We rode out to Old Field's cabin, where we sat a while gabbin. Avon's riding had drastically improved, and even the best of us were really moved. John took us out upon a mountain trail, 
We rode hard, trying not to fail. Up and around, we made it. A beautiful end. The view was magnificent. Our photo was taken. A fantastic stand. Then back down, we would descend. Back to the homestead, where we would shower. After wash and feed of lamb, we'd be fresh as a flower. From Raynella to Moscow, what a campaign, said Napoleon as he spilled the champagne. We spent the last night in fun without the company of the sun. We reminisced of our ride through the Kosciuszko National Park. To all we met, we left our mark. Fair dinkum, which means known to be the honest truth or some such same slang saying. For reference on some of the words in the poem that are slang from Australia. Dry as a bone, a brand name oilskin coat, palmy, People from England call themselves this slang. It indicates their country of origin. Jumper, a pullover sweater. Lou, the bathroom. Roo, what every Aussie calls a kangaroo. Blokes, or men and boys. Sheilas, women or girls. Causies, Australian word for bathing suit. I kept in touch with many of the wonderful people I met on my ride in the snowy mountains of Australia for years after the trek. A select few still keep in contact after all these years. I love the Australian accent and the people. Once I returned from Raynella, I stayed at Jerry's house with Cyril. Cyril was a character, and he would invite a couple friends over with young adults my age and tell stories. He made me laugh so many times. Jerry introduced me to Carol Ann and her young daughter Alina before she went home to Canada. They lived close to Jerry and owned horses. I spent time with them when I returned from the trek. Alina owned two Appaloosas and was showing one of the horses that she had. She was eight years younger than I was. Alina took me out riding as often as time and circumstances would allow. I also attended some local horse shows with them. Alina was a very accomplished youth rider and went on to win many championships in the Appaloosa horse world for four years after that. I was honored to have met her and gone horseback riding with her. During my time with Carol Ann and Alina, I was introduced to a gentleman that knew the owners of the Stadium Saddle Company and was given a tour of their facility and a brochure should I ever want to purchase another Australian stock saddle. Before I left Australia, I cannot bat bypass the one night I went into Brisbane for a movie and supper with Searle. Searle liked to drink beer. It was a Saturday night, and at 5 o'clock he announced that we should go for supper and a movie before I went back to Canada. We got dressed up and ready to go when Searle informed me that I have to drive Jerry's car because he's too intoxicated. Uh-oh. In Australia, they drive on the opposite side of the road that we do here in North America. And the steering wheel is also on the opposite side of the car. Until this point, I had driven very little and only short distances near Jerry's house. I had not gone anywhere near the interior of Brisbane. It was a city of more than one and a half million at the time. Cyril assured me that there was nothing to it and he would be my navigator. It was still daylight when we embarked on our evening out and with Cyril's navigation, we did indeed make it to the city and parked so that we could go for supper. We found a restaurant where we were sitting near a railing that looked down over another part of this mall we were in. We could see people walking below. Supper was rather embarrassing as Cyril would say rude things to the people sitting at any of the tables near us. He didn't like people staring, but he was being rather loud and disruptive and he would drop food onto the people walking below us. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. We walked to a movie theater nearby and went to see the movie I wanted to go watch. I don't remember what that movie was because Cyril passed out in the theater chair next to me and then proceeded to make himself comfortable by putting his feet up on the shoulder of the gentleman in front of him. I was glad it was dark in the theater, because I know my face was beet red with embarrassment. The guy got mad at Cyril and pushed his feet down. Then Cyril muttered some obscenity at him and passed out again. 
I was glad that it only happened once during the movie and figured that an hour and a half rest might sober Cyril up some before we went back to Jerry's house. The movie ended, and somehow we found the car and started driving back home. It was supposed to take 45 minutes to drive home. My intoxicated navigator got me going in the right direction, but Cyril said to me, you have to turn right there, as he was pointing to the off-ramp we just passed. On the highway, there was nowhere to turn around, and there was too much traffic on a Saturday night. We argued for five minutes about who was to blame, but we were unable to find any way to get back to that road we had missed. It took us an additional hour and a half before we made it home because of our altered route. Even though I was embarrassed by Searle and he messed up royally in the navigation department, it was still hilarious and memorable. We were quite the pair. Searle had tears in his eyes at the airport the day he dropped me off to fly home to Canada, even though he had harassed me and tried to make me miserable with his horridly dry sick sense of humor. I had given it right back to him, and we had become good friends. He said his daughter was close to my age, and he missed her too. I tearfully said my goodbyes and boarded the plane for home. After being away from my family and horses for two months, I was anxious to get home. I flew out of Brisbane, Queensland, on the 17th of April, and because of time change, I was home in the yard by 4.30 a.m. on the 18th. It was a very exciting morning. Everyone was so happy I was home. I had not slept since I left Australia, so I slept for a few hours. By noon, I was up and out at the barn greeting my horses. Raisin was happy to see me and nickered a greeting. Mighty wanted petting, too, so I gave him some treats and loving. Fury, however, missed me the most. He had his butt turned to me as he stood away from the other horses, and when I called his name, he gave me a dirty look over his shoulder, then faced away again. Oh, Fury. I walked up to him and held his face in my hands and told him that I missed him, too. I gave him loves, loves rubbing his face in all his favorite places, and gave him a treat. Once I had thoroughly petted and hugged him, he finally nuzzled me back. Even though my horses were well taken care of by my mom, dad, or Chad, and given attention, they knew I was gone and had missed me in their own special way. I was glad to be home, and my horses were too. That evening, my friends and family had a big surprise welcome home party for me. Jerry and her friend Joy, that had accompanied her to Canada, were there too. They set up a stereo and cleaned out the closet. We had a dance and a lot of fun that night. It was sure good to be home and know everyone else was happy to see me.